P.S. Ron says Percy's head for it. I'll bet Percy's really pleased. Ron doesn't seem too happy about it. Harry left as he put Hermione's letter aside and picked up her present. It was very happy. Knowing Hermione, he was sure it would be a large book full of very difficult spells, but it wasn't. Harry's heart gave a large bound as he ripped back the paper and saw the sleek black leather case with silver words stamped across it reading, Broomstick Servicing Kit. Wow, Hermione, Harry whispered, unzipping the case to tuck inside. To look inside, there was a large jar of fluid, high finish handle polish, a pair of gleaming silver tail twig clippers, a tiny brass compass to clip on your broom for long journeys, and a handbook of do it yourself broom care. Apart from his friends, the thing that Terry missed most about Hogwarts was Quidditch, the most popular sport in the magical world. Highly dangerous, very exciting, and played on broomsticks. Harry happened to be a very good Quidditch player. He had been the youngest person in a century to be picked for one of the Hogwarts house team. One of Harry's most prized possession was his Nimbus 2000 racing broom. Harry put the leather case aside and picked up his last parcel. He recognized the untidy scroll on the brown paper at once. This was from Hagrid, the Hogwarts gamekeeper. He tore off the top layer of paper and glimpsed something green and leathery, but before he could unwrap it properly, the parcel gave a strange quiver, and whatever was inside whatever was inside it snapped lightly as though it had jaws. Harry froze. He knew that Hagrid would never send him anything dangerous on purpose. But then Hagrid didn't have a normal person view of what was dangerous. Hagrid had been known to best be friends, giants, spiders, boy bitches, three-headed dogs from man in pups, and sneak a legal dragon axe into his cabin. Harry pocked the parcel nervously. It snapped loudly again. Harry reached for the lamp on his bedside table. Bedside table. Gripped it firmly in one hand and raised it over his hat ready to strike. Then he seized the rest of the wrapping paper in one hand and pulled, and out fell a book. Harry just had time to register its hand, some green cover, and blazoned with the golden tile to the monster book of monsters before it flipped onto its edge and scuttle side, always along the bat like some weird crab. Uh-oh, Harry muttered. The book toppled off the bat with a loud clunk and s- and shuffled rapidly across the room. Harry followed it still daily. The book was hiding in the dark space under his desk. Praying that the Dursleys were still fast asleep, Harry got down on his hands and knees and reached toward it. Ouch! The book snapped shut on his hand and then flapped past him, still scuttling on its cover. Harry scrambled around, threw himself forward, and managed to flatten it. 
Uncle Vernon gave a loud, sleepy grunt in the room next door. Hadwig and Arrow watched interestedly as Harry clumped off, struggling, broke tightly in his arms, hurried to his chest of drawers, and put out a belt which he buckled tightly around it. The monster burst out near and shuddered angrily, but could no longer flap and snap, so Harry threw it down on the bed and researched for Hagrid's cart. Dear Harry, happy birthday. Think you might find this useful for next year. Won't say no more here. Tell you when I see you. Hope the muggles are treating you right. All the best, Hagrid. It stuck Harry as a menace that Hagrid th thought a biting book would come in useful. But he put Hagrid's cart up next to Ron and Hermione's, grinning more broadly than ever. Now there was only the ladder from Hogwarts left. Noticing what, that it was rather thicker than usual, Harry slid open the envelope, pulled out the page of parchment wooden, and read, Dear Mr. Potter, please note that new school year will begin on September the 1st. The Hogwarts Express will leave from King's Cross Station, Platform 9 and 3 quarters. At 11 o'clock, third years are permitted to visit the village of Hogsmeade on certain weekend. Please give the enclosed permission from your parents or guardian to sign. A list of books. For next year is enclosed. Yours sincerely, Professor McGonagall, Deputy Headmistress. Harry pulled out the Hogsmeade permission from the look at it, no longer grinning. It would be wonderful to visit Hogsmeade on weekends. He knew it was an entirely wizarding village, and he had never set foot there. But how on earth was he going to persuade Uncle Vernon or Aunt Petunia to sign the form? He looked over at the alarm clock. It was now two o'clock in the morning. Decided that he'd worry about the Hogsmeade from where he woke up, Harry got back into bed and reached up to cross off the other day on the chart it made from for himself, counting down the days left until he returned to Hogwarts. Then he took his glasses and laid down, eyes open facing his three birthday cards. Extremely unusual though he was at the moment Harry Potter Felt just like everyone else. Glad for the time in his life that it was his birthday. Aunt Merge's big mistake. Harry went down to breakfast the next morning to find the three dirt leaves already sitting around the kitchen table. They were watching a brand new television, a welcome home for the summer present for Dudley, who had been complaining lately the summer present about the long walk between the fridge and the television in the living room. Dudley had spent more of the summer in the kitchen, his piggy little eyes fixed on the screen, and his five chins wobbling as he ate continually. Harry sat down between Dudley and Uncle Vernon, a large, beefy man with a very little neck and a lot of moustache. Far from wishing Harry a happy birthday, none of the Dudleys made any signs that they had noticed Harry enter the room, but Harry was far too used to this to care. Harry helped himself to a piece of toast and then took up the reporter on the television, who was halfway through the report 
an escaped convict. The public were the black is armed and extremely dangerous. A special hotline has been set up, and any sightings black should be reported immediately. No need to tell us he's good. No good," snorted Uncle Vernon, starting over the top of his newspaper at the prisoner. "Look at the state of him, the filthy Layla Vot. Look at his hair." He shot a nasty look sideways at Harry, whose untidy hair had always been a source of great annoyance to Uncle Vernon. Compared to the man on the television, however, whose scant face was surrounded by a matted elbow-length tangle, Harry felt very well groomed in it. The reporter had reappeared. The Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries will announce today. Hang on, broke. Uncle Vernon, staring furiously at the reporter, you didn't tell us where that maniac escaped from. What use is that? Lenata could be coming up the streets right now, and Petunia, who was bony and horse-faced, whipped around and peered intensely out of the kitchen window. Harry knew Aunt Petunia would simply laugh. To be the one to call the hotline number. She was the noisiest woman in the world, and spent and spent noisiest woman in the world, and spent most of his time spying on the boring low. A bitter neighbors. When will they learn? Said Uncle Vernon, pounding the table with his large purple fist. That tanging the only way to deal with this people. Very true, said Aunt Petunia, who was still quinting into Nestor's runner beans. Uncle Vernon drained his teacup, glanced at his watch, and added. I'd better be off in a minute. Petunia, Marge's trains get in in at ten. Harry, who thought had been upstairs with the broomstick, servicing kit, was brought back to earth with an unpleasant bump. And Marge, he blurted out. She's not coming here, is she? Aunt Marge was Uncle Vernon's sister. Even though she was not a blood relative to Harry, he had been forced to call her aunt all his life. Aunt Marge lived in the country, in a house with a large garden, where she bred bulldogs. She didn't often stay at Privet Drive, because she couldn't. Bear to leave her precious dogs, but each of her visits stood out terribly vividly in Harry's mind. At Dartley's fifth birthday party, Aunt Marsh had whacked Harry around the shins with her walking stick to stop him from beating Dartley at music school stadiums. A few years later, she had turned up at Christmas with a com. Pewterized robot for Dudley and a box of duck biscuit for Harry. For Harry, on her last visit, the ear from Harry started a towards Harry had accidentally. Harry had accidentally. Torden on the tail of her favorite dog, Reaper had chased Harry out into the garden, and up a tree, and Aunt Marge had refused to call him off until past a, a tree, and Aunt Marge had refused 
to call him off until past midnight. The memory of the incident still brought tears of laughter to Dudley's eyes. Merge will be here for a week, Uncle Vernon snarled. And while we're on the subject, he pointed a fat finger, threateningly, at Terry. We need to get a few things straight before I go and collect her. Dudley smirked and withdrew his gaze from the television. Watching Harry being bullied by Uncle Vernon was Dudley's favorite form of entertainment. Firstly, growled Aunt Vernon, "You'll keep a civil tongue in your head when you're talking to Marge." "All right," said Harry bitterly. "If she does when she's ta- talking to me." Secondly, said Uncle Vernon, acting as though he had not heard Harry's reply, "As Marge doesn't know anything about your abnormality, I don't want any funny stuff while she's here." You behave yourself, got me. If I will, if she does," said Harry, through gritted teeth. And thirdly," said Uncle Vernon. His mean little eyes now slit in his great purple face. We've told Merch you attend Saint Brutus Secure Center for incurably criminal boys. What? Harry yelled. And you'll be sticking to that story, boy, or there'll be trouble," spat Uncle Vernon. Harry sat there, white-faced and furious, staring at Uncle Vernon, hardly able to believe it. Aunt Merch coming for a week-long visit. It was the worst birthday present the Dursleys have ever given to him. Including the pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Well, Petunia said, "Uncle Vernon, getting heavily to his feet, I'll be off to the station. Then want to come along for the ride, daughters?" No, said Dudley, whose attention had returned to the television now that Uncle Vernon had finished threatening Harry. Dudley's got to make himself smart for his auntie. Said Aunt Petunia, smoothing Dudley's thick blood hair. Mommy's brought him a lovely new bow tie. Uncle Vernon clapped Dudley on his porky shoulder. See you in a bit, then he said, and he left the kitchen. Harry, who had been sitting in a kind, horrified trance, had a sudden idea. Abandoning his task, he got quickly to his feet and followed Uncle Vernon to the front door. Uncle Vernon was putting on his car coat. "I'm not taking you," he snarled, as he returned to see Harry watching him. "Like I wanted to come," said Harry coldly. "I want to ask you something." Uncle Vernon's eyes. Eyed him suspiciously. Third years at home, and my school are allowed to visit the village sometimes. Said Harry. So snapped Uncle Vernon, taking his car keys from a hook next door. I need you to sign this permission form. Said Harry in a rush. And why should I do that? Sneered Uncle Vernon, working pretendly to Aunt March. I go to the Saint. What sits Saint Brutus Secure Center of Incre. Probably criminal boys," bellowed Uncle Vernon, and Harry was pleased to hear a definite note of panic in Uncle Vernon's voice. "Exactly," said Harry, looking calmly up into Uncle Vernon's large purple face. "It's a lot to remember. I'll have to make it sound convincing, won't I? What if I accidentally let something slip?" You'll get the stuffing knocked out of you, won't you? Roared Uncle Vernon, advancing on Harry with his first raised. But Harry stood his ground. Knocking the stuffing out of me won't make Aunt Merge forget what I could tell her," he said grimly. Uncle Vernon stopped. First, his first still raised. 
his face an ugly puss. But if you sign my permission form, Harry went on quickly, I swear I'll remember where I'm supposed to go to school. And I'll act like a mug, like a normal and everything. Harry could tell that Uncle Vernon was thinking it over, even his teeth was speared and a vein was dropping in his temple. Right, he snapped finally. I shall monitor your behavior here, fully during Marge's visit. If at the end of it you've told the line and kept to the story, I'll sign you a ready form. He wheeled around, pulled open the front door, and slammed it so hard that one of the little panes of glass at the top fell out. Harry didn't return to the kitchen. He went back upstairs to his bedroom. If he was going to act like a real muggle, he'd better start now. Slowly and sadly, he gathered up all his presents and his birthday cards and hid them under the loose floorboard with his homework. Then he went to Hedwig's carriage. Errol seemed to have recovered. He and Hedwig were both asleep, hats under their wings. Harry sighed, then popped them both awake. Hedwig, he said gloomily, you're going to have to clear off for a week. Go with Errol. Run, run, I'll look after you. I'll write him a note explaining. And don't look at me like that. Hedwig's arm, large, umbered eyes were reproachful. It's not my fault. It's the only way I'll be allowed to visit talks me. With Ron and Hermione. Ten minutes later, Harold and Hedwig, who had a note to Ron bound to her leg, soared out of the window and out of sight. Harry, now feeling thoroughly miserable, put the empty cage away inside the word door. But Harry didn't have long to blot. In next to no time, Aunt Petunia was shrieking up the stairs for Harry to come down and get ready to welcome their guests. Do something about your hair, Aunt Petunia snapped as he researched the hole. Harry couldn't see the point of trying to make his hair lay flat. Aunt Merge laughed, criticizing him, so the untidier he looked, the happier she would be. All too soon, there was a chirp crunch of gravel outside as Uncle Bernard's car pulled back into the driveway. Then the clunk of the car doors and footstep on the garden path. Get the door, Aunt Petunia hissed at Harry. A feeling of great gloom in his stomach, Harry pulled the door open. On the threshold stood Aunt Marge. She was very like Uncle Vernon, large, beefy, and purple-faced. She even had a voice touch, though not as bushy as his. In one hand, she held an enormous suitcase, and tucked under the other was an old and evil-tempered bulldog. Where's my daughters? roared Aunt Marge. Where's my nephew Pooh? Dudley came waddling down the hall, his blonde hair plastered flat to his fat head, a bow tie just visible under his many chins. Aunt Marsh thrust the suitcase into Harry's neck, knocking the wind out of him, seized Dudley in a tight one arm tug, and planted a large kiss on his cheek. Marge's hugs because he was well paid for it, and sure enough, when they broke apart, Dudley had a crisp twenty-pound note clutched in his fat fist. Petunia shouted Aunt March, steering past Harry as though he was a half stand. Aunt March and Aunt Petunia kissed, or rather, Aunt March bumped her large jaws against Aunt Petunia's bony cheekbone. Uncle Bernard now came in, 
smiling jovially as he shut the door. Tea, Marge, he said. And what will Reaper take? Reaper can take some tea out of my saucer, said Aunt Marge as they all trooped into the kitchen, leaving Harry alone in the hall with the suitcase. But Harry wasn't complaining. Any excuse not to be with him to march was fine by him. So he began to heave the case of steers into the spare bedroom, taking as long as he could. By the time he got back to the kitchen, Aunt Merch had been supplied with tea and fruit cake, and Reaper was lapping noisily in the corner. Harry saw Aunt Petunia whined slightly at the speak of tea, and Joe flipped her clint floor. Aunt Petunia hated animals. Who is looking after the other dogs, Merch? Uncle Vernon asked. Oh, I've got Col- Colonel Foster managing them, boomed Aunt Merch. He's retired now. Good to him to have something to do. But I couldn't leave poor old Reaper. He pines. He pines if he's away from me. Reaper began to growl again at Harry. Sat down. He this directed Aunt March attention to Harry for the first time. So she barked. Still here are you? Yes, said Harry. Don't you say that? Yes, in that ungrateful tone, Aunt March growled. It's damn good of Vernon and Vetunia to keep you. Wouldn't have done it myself. You had gone straight to an orphanage if you'd been dumped on my doorstep. Harry was bursting to say that he'd rather live in an orphanage than with Dirtleys, but the thought of the housemaid's form stopped him. He forced his face into a painful smile. Don't you smirk at me," boomed Aunt March. "I can see you haven't improved since last I last saw you. I hoped school would knock some manners in you." She took a large gulp of tea, wiped her mustache, and said, "Where is that you sent him again, Vernon?" "Saint Brutus's," said Uncle Vernon promptly. It's a first-rate institution for hopeless cases. I see," said Aunt March. "Do they use to cane a Saint Brutus boy?" She barked across the table. "Er,"、uh, Uncle Vernon nodded curtly behind Aunt March's back. "Yes," said Harry. Then, feeling he might as well do the thing properly, he added, "All the time." "Excellent," said Aunt March. I won't have this nambly pambly wishy washy nonsense about not hitting people who deserve it. A good thrashing is what's needed in ninety nine cases out of a hundred. Have you been bitten often? Oh yeah," said Harry. "Lots of times." Aunt Merch narrowed her eyes. "I still don't like your tone, boy," she said. If you can speak of your beatings in the casual way, they clearly aren't hitting you hard enough, Petunia. I'd fight if I were you. Make it clear that you approve the use of extreme force in the boy's case. Perhaps Uncle Vernon was worried that Harry might forget their bargain. In any case, he changed the subject abruptly. Heard the news this morning, March. What about the escaped prisoner? Ah,、uh? as Aunt March started to make herself at home, Harry caught himself thinking most longly of life at n- number four without her. Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia usually encouraged Harry to stay out of their way, which Harry was only too happy to do. Aunt March, on the other hand, wanted Harry under her eyes. At all times, so that she could bomb out suggestions for an improvement, she d- she d- so she delighted in comparing Harry with Dudley, and took l- huge 
pleasure in buying that Lee is expensive present while glaring at Harry as though daring him to ask why he hadn't got a present too. She also kept throwing out dark hints about what Harry, what made Harry such an unsatisfactory person.